somewhere outside of Nashville, Tennessee. This is the award-winning podcast, Terror Reality. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for listening tonight. My name, as always, is Sandman, and I will be your guide through this strange realm of ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, aliens, conspiracy theories, and other unsolved mysteries that I like to call Parareality. Well, before we start off tonight's episode, let me tell you all the ways you can contact me here at the podcast, because there are a few different ways that you can go about doing that, and here they are. First of all, you can always email me. That is the quickest and easiest way to get in touch with me. That email address is sandman at parareality.com. That's sandman at parareality.com. Second, you can find me on Facebook by going to my Parareality page on Facebook. That's www.facebook.com slash sandman.parareality. And you can message me on Facebook or leave me a message or a post on my my wall on Facebook. And third, you can always get hold of me on my other social media accounts, which would be Twitter and Instagram. My username on both of those just to keep it simple, is at Para Real Radio. That's at Para Real Radio. So those are all the different ways you can get in contact with me here on the show. Oops, almost forgot about the studio line. You can always call the studio line. It's a direct line into the secret bunker here. The number is 615-692. 1170. That number to call once again is 615 692 1170. And you can just leave me a message on the voicemail. Now, if you do decide to leave me a message on that voicemail, just remember that just simply by leaving me that message, you are giving me permission to play your comment back on the air. So if you do not want me to do that, you need to tell me somewhere in your message. I'm always looking for an interesting story to get on the podcast. So if you've got a story that you'd like to get on the show, you just kind of want to tell it and uh, have the world hear about it, you can leave me a message on that voicemail. Now, there's like a three-minute time limit on that. So if you run out of time, call back and pick up where you left off. And if you got to call back multiple times, well, hell, you got to call back multiple times. So those are all the different ways you can get in contact with me, Sandman, here on the show. And let me recap that once again. Quickest and easiest way is email, sandman at parareality.com. You can always find me on my Facebook page. Leave me a message on Facebook Messenger or post on the wall on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash sandman.parareality. Or you can Reach me on my other social media accounts, which would be Twitter and Instagram. My username on both of those is at Radio. Just send me a DM on Twitter or Instagram. And finally, call me on the studio line. Leave a message, 615-692-1170. All right. Anthony Quinn Warner better known as the Nashville Bomber. Well, he's been the subject of no less than four episodes of this podcast since he blew himself up on Christmas Day last year, taking an entire city block of historic downtown Nashville with him. Two weeks ago, the FBI released their final report on the bomber and why he did what he did. So tonight is going to be the fifth and final episode that I'm going to be devoting to the Nashville Bomber series. Now, I'll read to you the FBI report in its entirety, and then I'll give my final opinions on the case. And I'll have to say, though, that I'm kind of disappointed in the FBI report because it doesn't really give us hardly any new information. In fact, I think that my own investigation of the event has revealed just a little bit more than what they have, or at least what they're publicly admitting to what they have. Now, I'm not saying 
that I'm better than the FBI. I'm not saying that at all, not implying that. It's just a little more forthcoming with the information, I think, is what I am. And, as, of course, to learn more, you'll need to turn on, tune in, and find out. But before we begin that, my favorite part of the show, fan mail. Of the fan mail. Okay, so. I'm not going to read a fan mail in particular right now. I'm going to discuss something. So, here lately, I've received a lot of inquiries about uh, how to be a guest on the podcast. I've got people who are like uh, doing documentaries and writing books and they're paranormal investigators and they they uh you know just want to come on the show and talk about their experiences and stuff and i've had a lot of people like that who have emailed me asking about you know hey i want to be a guest how do i go about doing it blah 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 so i wanted to take a minute and kind of publicly respond to all of these now i of course i email everybody individually and and talk to them as well but I wanted to take a moment in case there's somebody out there that's listening to this podcast that's thinking about being a guest on the show, whether you're, uh, whether you've got a, a, a documentary, or whether you're you've written a book, or whether you're um, and just a, a, a paranormal investigator who wants to talk about some of your investigations, or whether you're just someone who's just your everyday normal citizen out there who has experienced something that you can't explain and you want to talk about it or you need to talk about it and you're looking for answers, well, I'm your man. I love to talk to people who have experienced things that they can't explain, things that they're looking for answers for maybe they need help with. Um, I love talking to people like that. But once again, if you've got a documentary, if you've got a book, or a website you want to promote, or if you're a paranormal investigator, or have, or even if you have a team and want to talk about some of your investigations, and I'd love to talk to you too. So how do you go about getting in touch with me? Well, I just spent five minutes telling you how you can contact me, right? But the probably the quickest and easiest way would be to send an email. Just email me, sandman at parareality.com, and just give me, you don't have to tell me your whole entire story, Just give me a quick, you know, Reader's Digest version of what it is that you're looking to do and why you would like to be a guest on the podcast. Now, most people are uh, actually getting in touch with me, not necessarily by email, but they're, they're DMing me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. And, um, excuse me, I don't always immediately get those DMs, um, especially if it's one of those things where you have to request me to add you as a, a contact or something like that first before we can can talk. I don't always get those in uh, what I would consider to be a timely manner. So there have been a couple of times where people have, have DM'd me like that, and it's been like a two or three days before I've noticed that and gotten back in touch with them because they're not on my contact list. So I really prefer it if you want to be on the show that you email me, sandman at parareality.com. That's the absolute quickest and easiest way, fastest way to get in touch with me. I've also got a contact form on my website if you want to go to the website and uh, fill out the contact form. I've had some people who have done that in the past, and that works out very well because I just sends the form right to me, sends the email right to me. So if you're interested in being on the show, I'd love to have you. I will interview just about anybody. I don't do everybody that requests me to interview them. Some people, there's just not a good of enough story there to make for maybe an entire episode. Uh, Or sometimes, you know, it's just not something that I wanted to talk about on the show. It doesn't fit with it overall theme of the show Um, but what I really love to specialize in is what I what I tell people is what I specialize in is talking to people who are normal everyday people just like me who've had some sort of strange experience that they want to talk about maybe they're looking for answers 
and uh, they just need maybe they just need to talk to somebody about something. Um, I, you know, if you, if you don't have to have a website you're promoting, you don't have to have a documentary or a movie or a book or be a member of a paranormal investigation team. You don't have to be hawking anything. If you just have had some sort of experience, whether you think you've seen a ghost or you live in a haunted house or you've had an encounter with some unknown creature or uh, a UFO encounter, something that you just can't explain, something that you want to, to talk about, or maybe something that you need help with trying to figure out what it was, I want to talk to you. So email me, sandman at parareality.com, and let's get you on the podcast. So that's what I'm looking for. That's how you can get in touch with me. The fastest, quickest, easiest way, send me that email, sandman at parareality.com. And I hope that I hear from you soon. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about Anthony Quinn Warner, better known as the Nashville Bomber, the man who detonated a bomb in downtown Nashville on Christmas morning. And he was he was just carrying out a plan to die by suicide and was not attempting to commit a terrorist act. And that's according to the final report released by the FBI on March the 15th, just two weeks ago. The FBI's report is supposedly the most comprehensive explanation of the motives of 63-year-old Anthony Quinn Warner, who died in the blast. However, in my opinion, it doesn't really tell us much more than we already knew. The FBI statement sets out to resolve some of the lingering mysteries of an explosion that initially perplexed investigators and the public as well because it appeared to lack an obvious motive or fit a clear profile. Though the blast damaged dozens of buildings, it took place early on a holiday morning, Christmas Day, well before the downtown streets would be bustling with activity on Christmas morning and was even preceded by a recorded announcement warning anyone in the area that a bomb would soon detonate. Now, in their news release, the FBI said that it had completed, and I quote, a significant portion of its investigation into the blast and concluded that Warner acted alone in building and detonating this explosive device. The FBI reviewed over 3,000 pounds of evidence from the blast site and sorted through more than 2,500 tips and conducted more than 250 interviews during the course of their investigation. They also say that Warner was grappling with paranoia and eccentric conspiracy theories, but there really aren't any indications that he was motivated by social or political ideology and that his actions were, and I quote again, determined to not be related to terrorism. They also added that their analysis didn't reveal an intent to cause uh, social or political change or to resolve some kind of personal grievance that he had. Instead, the investigators say that the bomb was an intentional act in an effort to end his own life, and that's a direct quote from their report. And that was driven in part by a totality of life stressors, and I'm quoting once again, including paranoia, long-held individualized beliefs adopted from several eccentric eccentric conspiracy theories, and the loss uh, loss of stabilizing anchors and deteriorating interpersonal relationships. And that's a direct quote from the FBI report. Now, Warner chose the location and timing so that the explosion would be impactful, but still it would 
minimize the likelihood of undue injury. And this is, once again, according to the statement from the FBI, which, by the way, also concluded that he acted alone and set off the bomb to end his own life, just like I stated. Now, despite speculation that Warner may have been motivated by conspiracy theories about uh, 5G technology, given the proximity of the explosion to uh, the AT&T building and the resulting havoc to cell phone and, and basically all kinds of communication services in the area, uh, FBI spokesperson Joel Siskovic said that the investigation found no indication that AT&T had anything to do with Warner's selection of the location. Well, one of the things that he did before he blew himself up was he sent packages with writings and videos promoting these wild conspiracy theories to multiple people. And he did this just in the, the few days, the handful of days uh, right before the blast. In one of the letters that was in the packages that he mailed out, Warner claimed that aliens have been attacking Earth since 2011 and shared the conspiracy theory that the planet is controlled by lizard people. And if you've listened to any of the other four episodes of this podcast about all that, you'll be familiar with the theory of the reptilians, where that came from, who David Icke is, and we'll be talking about that here in a little bit. So this blast occurred on Christmas Day, right, very early in the morning. Nashville police responded to a report that shots had been fired near the AT&T data center in the heart of historic downtown Nashville. Uh, When the cops arrived on the scene, they found that there was an RV parked there. The windows were covered, and there was a loudspeaker on it that was blaring a warning that a bomb would soon detonate. Then, inexplicably, the audio switched to a recording of Petulia Clark's 1964 hit downtown shortly before the blast. Now, during the explosion, fortunately, the only person that was killed was Anthony Quinn Warner. There were three people who were injured, but that was it. Of course, it caused devastation to the historic downtown district. Just a that whole block of Second and Commerce just was almost obliterated. And the bomb exploded precisely at 6.30 a.m. Fortunately, though, uh, structural engineers have uh, looked extensively at the damage to all these historic buildings, and they have come to the conclusion that none of them need to be demolished, so they just need to be rehabbed. And that's a good thing for, for historic downtown Nashville. So investigators have said that Warner intentionally chose the location at the intersection of 2nd and Commerce Streets and the timing of the explosion to minimize the chances of injuring other people. Of course, like I said, there are three people who were wounded in the explosion, and it it, it, it crippled, man, because of it was right there in front of the AT&T station, and it just crippled AT&T services in the area for days. And it wasn't just AT&T. It was it was some other cell phone services and stuff like that too. That I mean, it, it just it showed how vulnerable uh, that communications hub is to terrorist acts. And what happens when one just one of those things goes down? Yeah, that disrupted communications and the whole entire Middle Tennessee area up into Southern Kentucky and over into uh, west, Georgia, east, east Georgia. And, it, it, I mean, it was just massive, massive, massive disruption of communication. And even if Warner didn't leave behind any kind of clear motive, he did take steps in the weeks leading up to the bombing that, really were clues that he wasn't going to come out of this thing alive. For example, he had a car that he gave away to one of his closest friends who worked at a Waffle House where he would frequently eat. 
and he told her that uh, he had cancer and, you know, it was getting close. He wasn't going to be able to beat it. It was getting close to time that he was going to die, and he wanted her to have his car. So he told her, you know, look, dying of cancer here, here's my car. But it's not clear if he really did have cancer. He also signed a document that transferred his home in the Antioch area, which is a suburb of Nashville that he'd lived in for like 20-plus years. He, he signed a document that transferred ownership of this home to a woman who lives in California who was the daughter of a former girlfriend of his. And he didn't, I mean, he didn't charge her any money for this. He asked for nothing in return for this. And she didn't even really know that he was doing this either. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, he was a, a freelance um, IT person, worked with computers, and he told the guy that he did most of his work for that uh, that he was retiring. So you have two different stories here. You have, oh, I've got cancer, here's my car, and, oh, I'm not going to, be able to work for you anymore because I'm, I'm just going to retire. Now, there was a neighbor who, uh, now, first of all, Warner didn't have a lot of friends. Apparently, he only had a couple, and one of the closest friends was that uh, waitress from the Waffle House who he gave his car to. Uh, the neighbors didn't know him very well. He kind of kept to himself. He didn't talk to them a lot, but there was one neighbor who uh, saw him outside by the mailbox one day and just made a little bit of a small talk with him, and this was right before the Christmas holiday, and um, he, you know, asked him, you know, what you got going on for Christmas, blah, 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 and uh, Warner said something to effect of like, oh, yeah, Nashville and the world is never going to forget me, and, you know, this guy had no idea what he was talking about. You know, there's nothing really there to report to the police. Hindsight, you know, oh, maybe I should have, but that's that's the advantage of looking at things in hindsight, you know. But there was no indicator just from that one little statement that he was going to do really anything. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, the Nashville law enforcement, the PD here in, in Nashville's finest, um, they came under a little bit of uh, scrutiny in the days immediately following the bombing because it uh, it got uh, revealed that uh, the Metro Police Department had actually been alerted about uh, Warner in 2019, and his his girlfriend at the time had told the cops that he was uh, building bombs in that RV that he exploded himself in. And uh, the police um, didn't make contact with him or see inside his RV. And, you know, I don't think just because it's a, an accusatory statement made by one person, I don't think that that's going to give uh, them enough teeth to, to get a – um, search warrant for that anyway. You're going to have to have a little bit more than just, well, somebody told me, you know. So, I, and I could be totally wrong, but it seems to me to be logical to assume that just because one person says, hey, this guy's doing X, Y, Z, that's not necessarily going to warrant a judge. It's not going to give a judge enough reason to issue a search warrant for the the residents, but I could be wrong. So here it is nearly, well, yeah, it's three months after the explosion. And the blast site downtown still, it's man, it's still closed off to the, to the public, still closed off to traffic, and you can't get down there. I posted some pictures up on, on uh, my Instagram account at Parareal Radio, uh, posted it up on my Facebook page. You can see it, uh, facebook.com slash sandman.parareality. It's under Nashville bombing. Um, you know, the it's, uh, it's still, it, they've cleaned it up a lot, but you've still got boarded up windows 
that are all over the place. This some of these buildings are Civil War era buildings. You know, this historic thing that I keep saying, this historic downtown Nashville statement that I keep making, that's no joke. You know, <coughs> there's a whole block that's of, of these historic buildings that are just lucky that we're not going to have to tear them down, but they'll never be the same again, you know. So instead of being able to come down there and enjoy this area and this historic area of Nashville, you've got chain link fences that are lining the street and, you know, they're still cleaning up. They've cleaned up a lot of it, but the cleanup efforts are still continue. And that's going to be, man, a long, long time to go before all the repairs are complete. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, um, sometime next year, really, before businesses can start reopening there. I mean, you just have to, you can look at a picture that I can post on and put it, you know, on my social media, but that, that doesn't really do it justice. You have to see the devastation for yourself to really uh, appreciate how devastating that was. So what does the FBI final report on the Nashville bombing say? Well, it just so happens that I have this statement. And it's not a very it's not a very long statement. It's like I said at the top of this thing, this is considered um the the most comprehensive explanation of Warner's motives. And I just don't see how this is considered the most comprehensive explanation of his motives. It's no real new information, and it's so short. This the statement is so. Short. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't guess they're supposed to release a book or anything, but still, it just seems like there's not enough to it here. I'm not. Uh, so just let me read it. All right. So here we go. FBI final report on the Nashville bombing. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, U.S. Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Tennessee, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, Metro Nashville Police Department, Tennessee Highway Patrol, and the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation have concluded a significant portion of the investigation into the explosion that occurred on December 25, 2020 at approximately 6.30 a.m. Central Time in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. Following the explosion, the FBI worked closely with our law enforcement partners on a coordinated and comprehensive investigation. After recovering more than 3,000 pounds of evidence from the blast site, combing through more than 2,500 tips, and conducting more than 250 interviews, the investigative team has reached the following conclusions. The investigation found that Anthony Quinn Warner of Antioch, Tennessee, acting alone, built and ultimately detonated the vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. His actions were determined to not be related to terrorism. The investigative team took diligent steps to determine the reason or reasons why Warner decided to construct and ultimately detonate his device in downtown Nashville on December 25, 2020. The FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, based in Quantico, Virginia, further assisted the local investigative team in answering this question. Based on analysis of the information and evidence gathered throughout the investigation, the FBI assesses Warner's detonation of the improvised explosive device was an intentional act in an effort to end his own life, driven in part by a totality of life stressors, including paranoia, long-held individualized beliefs adopted from several eccentric conspiracy theories, and the loss of of stabilizing anchors and deteriorating interpersonal relationships. The FBI assesses Warner specifically 
chose the location and timing of the bombing so that it would be impactful while still minimizing the likelihood of causing undue injury. The FBI's analysis did not reveal indications of a broader ideological motive to use violence to bring about social or political change, nor does it reveal indications of a specific personal grievance focused on individuals or entities in and around the location of the explosion. It is important to note that only Warner knows the real reason why he detonated his explosive device. However, at this time, the FBI is confident, based on evidence collected, Warner's own writings, and interviews with those who knew him best, that the above assessment is accurate. Special Agent in Charge Douglas Korneski of the FBI Memphis Field Office stated, The FBI would like to thank the citizens and private sector partners of Nashville, Tennessee, for their support during the response and investigation, especially those who provided tips and volunteered their time and resources. Additionally, the collaborative efforts of all local, state, and federal agencies who responded to this incident and the hundreds of hours dedicated by their men and women were truly invaluable to this unified effort. They exemplified the tireless dedication we've come to expect from those who respond to these types of critical incidents. And then there goes to be several pages about who helped in the investigation. You know, they named people from the FBI offices and the the ATF offices, the DOJ, Metro Nashville, Tennessee Highway Patrol, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, blah, blah, blah. They spend more time an effort listing who all helped in the investigation and naming them than they did actually what was contained in the final report. So basically the FBI is saying, well, we really don't know why he did it, but he didn't do it to try to uh, pro- promote any type of uh, ideological uh, belief, and he wasn't trying to make a political statement. Well, I not... convinced that that's everything that they know because this guy emailed several packages to different people and we don't know what was in those packages. Now, I I only have um, information on what was in one of the packages that he sent. Now, you can speculate that he sent the same thing to all these different people but we really don't know. You can also speculate that different people receive different bits of information too. Um, I'm assuming that everybody that he sent these packages to turned their stuff over to the FBI. But with everything that that was contained in those, I can't believe that there wasn't something that would give more of an indication as to why he did what he did. Um, I, I, I wonder if the FBI is not deliberately withholding information from the public. Um, and the reason I say that is because the location that he chose was right in front of that AT&T switching station, that AT&T hub. And it caused so much disruption to communications, not just cellular communications, but communications as a whole. It caused so much problems with that. I'm wondering if they just don't want to say, you know, maybe he had some grievance with the AT&T. Remember, his father used to work for Bell South, which was brought up, bought up, bought out by AT&T. So he had to have, you know, some kind of insider knowledge about something going on in there. Plus, he was an IT guy. You know, um, it's just, uh, I mean, it could all be 
you know, coincidental, but man, there's a lot of coincidences going there. You know, circumstantial evidence. People have been convicted on circumstantial evidence in the past. So, you know, I'm, I just wonder if maybe the FBI is not withholding some sort of of evidence back from us. Now, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they're not giving us everything that they know. But I'm wondering if they're not holding back more critical evidence because of this AT&T thing, that maybe he really was trying to take out AT&T, and they just don't want people to think that. Now, I will say that it is absolutely 100% believable that the FBI's report is completely accurate. And it's also 100% believable that the FBI's report is withholding information as well. So we don't have a clear answer here. And because we don't have a clear answer, this is going to be something that's never going to be case closed, shut the book on it. It's, it's a done deal. There's too many unanswered questions, and this case will never be resolved unless the, in, unless the FBI is withholding some evidence that could could solve it, could could give us that closure that we need, and they release it eventually, this case is never going to really go away. I mean, now, as far as the impact, it really doesn't have a global impact. It really only impacts the city of Nashville. You know, and I'm sure uh, on Christmas Day this year, you know, there will be all kinds of news stories, and we'll have a moment of remembrance and blah, 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 and this, that, and the other. Um, but still, it wasn't that um, big of an event, right? I mean, yeah, it made national headlines, but it kind of went away as quickly as as it showed up. It was only news for just a few days. So, you know, this is not something that um, is going to be really huge in the conspiracy theory world. Uh, but you know, I am a conspiracy theorist uh, of some of sorts, and I just I, because I live here in Nashville, I don't think that you know this is something that's going to go away. Uh, but this is not going to be something that that a lot of people, maybe besides me, are going to be you know uh, talking about for for a long time to come. Um, I just think that this is this FBI report is just not. I'm not saying it's bunk. I'm just saying it doesn't give us everything that we need for closure on this. So what did, what were his eccentric beliefs? What did he, you know, believe? Well, if you've listened to the other four um, episodes in this series, you'll know. But in case you didn't, let me recap it for you, okay? So Warner believed in the reptilians, which is um, a conspiracy theory that was first uh, proposed in the 90s by um, a British guy named David Icke. And he's pretty much made a career off of promoting this belief that there is a secret race of reptilian-like aliens that are living in underground bases among us here on earth and have been doing so for millennia and that they have the ability to shape shift into human forms and that they have um, basically been controlling all of the major events in human history uh, since recorded time. Um they have infiltrated the royal family. Some of the royal family are actually lizard people. Uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton are lizard people. I think he believes that Oprah Winfrey, I could be wrong on that one, was a lizard person. Um, so, you know, all kinds of political people here in the United States were, were lizard people. Uh, it's just the list goes on and on. And Warner believed in this theory. And as a matter of fact, 
he would uh, take the RV that he blew himself up in, he would take that RV out to one of our many beautiful state parks here in Tennessee, the Montgomery Bell State Park. He would go out there and uh, hunt lizard people. Now, in the last episode of this series, I was talking about him and his lizard people, his his reptilian alien conspiracy theory beliefs. And I, I don't think that it that that um necessarily played a part in um why he killed himself. Um because I think if if he was trying to bring attention to um the fact that there's lizard people living among us and he wanted to expose them and maybe take a few out. It stands to reason that he would go to Montgomery Bell State Park where he thought these creatures were and blow himself up in Montgomery Bell State Park trying to take out a few of those people with him, right? So I'm, I'm not sure that his reptilian alien lizard people belief system played a part in in all of this, I just don't see how him blowing himself up in the middle of downtown Nashville would equate to him bringing um, attention to the lizard people. Seems like you would want to do that in Montgomery Bell State Park. Um, Maybe he thought the, the lizard people had infiltrated AT&T. Maybe he thought that they were using AT&T as, a, as you know, their communications hub or something. I, that's just as plausible as anything else is, right? Uh, I don't know. And apparently the FBI doesn't either. But I just am not buying that. I think that they know more than what they're they're admitting to. There's got to be more to the story. I'm just not satisfied with we don't know why he did it in the end. I mean, once again, it, that could very well be it. And if that's really it, then, you know, so be it. That's what it is. But it just seems to me like there's got to be more to the story. And I would think that the FBI, with access to, to everything that, they had all of the stuff that he had in his home, all of these packages that he mailed off to people that I would think that they would have more of a um, clue as to why he did it other than, well, I don't know. So there's your Anthony Quinn Warner story. The final chapter from the FBI is, we don't know why he did it. I just, I don't know. Having a hard time swallowing that. I sure would like to know what was in all of those packages. I, I could probably do a Freedom of Information Act, but I don't know if there's some sort of statute. I've never done an FOIA, so I don't know if there's like some sort of like statute of, or you know, like there's a, t- a timeline. Like, does it have to be out for so many years, you know, or something? I, I don't know. Can I request it now? Is it too soon is what I'm saying? I don't know. Hey, I'm going to ask for help here. I've never done an FOIA. So if if you're listening to this and you've done an FOIA, maybe we need to collaborate. Maybe I need to get with, with some of the people. You know who I should talk to? I should talk to the UFO people because they do FOIAs all the time. I think I'll get in touch with Ryan Sprague. I've talked to him a few times. You know, he's the the host of the Somewhere in the Skies podcast. Um, not that he's ever going to listen to this, but maybe I should get in touch with him and talk to him about that. That would be uh, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I think I could do that. <laughs> but so anyway, to wrap things up, the FBI is saying they don't really have any idea why Anthony Quinn Warner blew himself up on down, in downtown Nashville on Christmas Day 2020, but they do know that it didn't have anything to do with his political beliefs. He was not trying to make a statement. Um, they're just saying that uh, basically he was going crazy. 
could it be that he took himself out like that because he did have cancer and wanted to go under his own terms? Absolutely 100% possible. Although the FBI does not mention anything like that in the report. Now, I know there's a thing called, you know, HIPAA about patient privacy and all that sorts of stuff. But if you blow yourself up and you take out an AT&T hub and, you know, an entire historic block of downtown Nashville, I think that if the FBI came knocking on your door, you know, the doctor and said, hey, we need to see this dude's medical records, I think it's okay to give them to him. Besides, the dude's dead. So you're not violating his rights of privacy because he has none anymore because he's dead. Uh, I I am... um, a little bit dissatisfied with the fact that the FBI did not mention anything about him having cancer or not. I don't know that they investigated that. I would love to have some more intel on that. So did he really have cancer? Is that why he why he did it? We don't know. The FBI is not forthcoming with that. Did he do it to try to make a statement about uh the reptilians living among us, I think we can safely rule that out and say no, that he wasn't really trying to bring attention to that. Because if he was, I think he would have done it in Montgomery Bell State Park where he believed the reptilians were. Was he trying to um, make some other statement or bring something else to light, maybe about the vulnerability of the AT&T building Maybe he wanted to show how vulnerable our communication systems are. Maybe he was trying to get revenge against AT&T for some sort of perceived wrong that he felt like happened to his family or his dad or himself. We don't know. The FBI is not saying. And that's what I have problems with is the statement of, well, we really don't know, just doesn't cut it for me. I think they have more information than what they are telling us. So I guess the rest of this is to be continued. Will there be a, you know, any more um, information that's going to be revealed about this? I highly doubt it. It's not that big of a case for uh, this to stay in the public eye for a long period of time. I don't think there's going to be enough people such as myself who are looking into this who are going to be able to find out any new information. Now, I will keep my, I I will promise you this. I will look into doing a Freedom of Information Act uh, request to the FBI for them to release documents about the Anthony Quinn Warner explosion, and I'll see what happens. I'm going to, I'm going to contact some people who are, uh, have more expertise about FOIAs than I do because, like I said, I've never done one. I've thought about doing it in the past. I just never have. But if I'm going to do it, I want to do it right. So I'm going to reach out to some people who I know and who I'm acquainted with who can help me with this FOIA. And uh, I'll ask them about what their advice is on if this is something I should even do now or do I need to wait, and we'll see. And maybe... Just maybe one day I'll have some documents that hasn't been made public yet, and I can come back and revisit this. But I'm not going to just let this go. I'm going to keep on looking into this. And if I find out new information, I promise you I will let you know. So that about does it. That's about all I can do up to now. So am I going to say Nashville bomber case closed? No, I'm not. I'm going to say to be continued. Well, I hope that you enjoyed tonight's episode of Parareality. Let me know what your ideas and thoughts about it are. Send me that email, sandman at parareality.com, or get in touch with me through the social media accounts. That's uh, the Parareality page on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash sandman.parareality, or Instagram and Twitter at Parareal Radio is my username on both of those. Don't forget you can also call the studio line at 615-692-1170 and leave me that message. Now you can also get in touch with me on the Parareality.com website. I do have a contact form on the website. Uh, just, hey, you know what? 
you should just go to the website and check it out, man. I think I've got a great website. That's a place where you can keep up on the latest news from all around the world about what's going on in the paranormal. I've got UFO stories, ghost stories, cryptozoological stories, all kinds of weird stuff from all around the world. That content's updated almost daily, and it's on the Paranews section of the Parareality website. Website. You can also shop in the Parareality store and maybe watch a few videos that I've got posted on my website. Um, man, I, I've updated the website just this year in January and added some content, moved some pages around, made it a little bit more user-friendly. So be sure to check out Parareality.com. You can also listen to all of the episodes of Parareality um, just about that have been not, well, all, you can listen to a lot. Let's put it this way. I've got some archives up there. I've got the archive page up. You can go to the archive page and listen to a ton of past episodes of Parareality, including this one. And it's, and it's all free. I don't charge you a, a thing for it. Um, I also have on the archives page, I also have um, some of my other podcasts that uh, I've done over the years. Parareality was... Uh, it started out on Live 365, so I've got, a, a, I think, almost like an entire, the entire first season ever of Parareality posted in the archives there. You could tell that, that uh, I didn't know what I was doing that first season, but it's there for you to listen to. When I was on uh, terrestrial radio, WRFN, Radio Free Nashville, here uh, right outside of Nashville, I have just about every episode that I did uh, on Radio Free Nashville. I have that on the archives. And I also have my, the other two podcasts that I do. Did you know that I do two other podcasts besides this one? Yep, I sure do. And you can listen to those on the Pair Reality Archive site as well. The first podcast that I do is one called Set It Off. It has nothing to do with the paranormal. It's a 30-minute podcast that airs once a month on the last Friday of every month. And uh, it's just about anything that just, it, it's, I get frustrated, I see something that I want to talk about, and I talk about it. So it is a free-form, half-hour podcast where I talk about anything and everything, and I give my unfiltered opinion on a lot of stuff. So if you want to uh, listen to that podcast, it's called Set It Off. All you got to do is go to the, uh, the archive site on uh, Parareality, working on getting that added to iTunes, so maybe one day it will be available on iTunes as well. The other podcast that I do is called Scared to Death, and this is old-timey radio plays, the best that I can find of uh, horror and science fiction radio plays from like the the 40s and the 50s. I play those right there on Scared to Death. That's also available on iTunes. All I got to do is search for Scared to Death on iTunes, or you can just go to parareality.com and check it out on the archive site. Speaking of parareality, this podcast can be heard on your favorite podcast station. Just search for parareality. And if you have a smart speaker, you can listen there too. If you've got any of those podcast stations activated on your uh, device, just say, play the Pair Reality Podcast. And bam, there you are, listening to the podcast. And I've also got a YouTube account, and you can listen to the podcast there too because I upload all the audio to YouTube. And it is YouTube. Uh, dot com slash user slash parareality one the number one that's how you can find me on youtube or you can just search youtube for parareality and you'll see it right there uh like i said you can listen to all the audio of the podcast there i've got some great videos too like some uh ufo and paranormal documentaries some documentaries about my, one of my favorite subjects chemtrails um it's got uh, all kinds of videos up there. Some of the terrible videos that I did on my very short-lived uh, web TV show where I was trying to um, do a, a, a web TV show. Not a well, web TV. You know, I was trying to do an internet TV show and just by myself. And it was horrible. 
I didn't even finish out the season that I had uh, said I was going to do. It was that bad. But I got those those videos up there so you can watch them just, you know, for your viewing pleasure. I also have a Patreon account for the podcast, and I'd love it if you'd sign up to be a patron. There are three tiers of support, and all are extremely affordable, $5 a month or less. Each level offers exclusive content, along with the ability to help create podcast episodes and even the chance to be a guest or a co-host on the podcast. So to learn more, head on over to patreon.com slash parareality. 100% of the proceeds from Patreon goes back into producing quality content for this podcast. This doesn't produce itself for free, and I don't make any money, anything that is that I make from Patreon or that I get from my uh, merchandise shop um, goes right back into producing content for this for this podcast. Uh, if you want to buy some merch, go to parareality.com, click on the uh, the shop there, and uh, you can buy all kinds of Parareality merchandise. And I would appreciate a little support from everybody. I need all the support I can get <laughs> for sure. All right. The next episode of Parareality is going to air on April 16th at 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time. So make sure that you turn on, tune in, and find out. Parareality is a proud member of the Straight Up Strange Podcast Network. We have so many podcasts on that network, it is ridiculous. If you want to check out more quality paranormal podcasts like this one, head on over to straightupstrange.com to get a list of all the podcasts that are in the network. You want to follow them on Twitter as well, Straight Up Strange on Twitter. Great network full of great people with great podcasts. Everybody, I hope that this podcast opens your mind up to new ways of thinking, expands your consciousness, and produces a change in the way you see the world. If you wish to change, you must lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe. I hope you have a wonderful evening, wonderful weekend, and I'll see you guys again in a couple of weeks. Good night, everybody. If you wish to change, you must first lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe.